by now pretty much everyone is aware that uh, the Roman Catholic Church has issued some new instructions with respect to same-sex unions and non-traditional unions of people that seems pretty clearly to be liberalizing the church's position. Um, I'm going to start off in this segment talking about that, but then talking more broadly about gender critical theory and the way that it's been enacted across many different facets in the church globally. The Roman Catholic Church, of course, being a hugely influential Christian group. Um, and I, I say the word Christian not necessarily because I'm 100% in agreement with Roman Catholic doctrine, otherwise I would be Roman Catholic, but they have roots that go back uh, a lot further than Methodism, which is the tradition I'm a part of. I'm a global Methodist pastor. And um, they have huge influence internationally, even if in uh, America they have lost pretty much all their standing with um, most people. They, uh, they still have a role to play. So here's, um, here's the article that was put out by NPR a couple days ago. The title was, Pope Francis Approves Catholic Blessings for Same-Sex Couples, but not for Marriage. So we're, I'm going to try—I've not read— the primary source document. I'll show it to you. It's long. I just I don't have the time for it right now. But I will do some of this article, and then I, I have a couple ways of making sense of this before we turn to another topic, sort of a related topic. Um, here, here's the article. Pope Francis has granted his formal approval allowing Catholic priests to bless same-sex couples so long as they do not appear to endorse their marriage marking the Church's most permissive decree yet on the issue of same-sex couples. The Declaration, published Monday in a new document titled Fiducia Supplicans on the pastoral meaning of blessings, marks a major departure for the Vatican, which only two years ago had said God cannot bless sin in a controversial 2021 decision about same-sex couples. Monday's document was approved by Pope Francis. So we're going to get into the nature of blessings and what it is that you can bless and why you should bless as a, a religious leader. But it's interesting, just a couple of years ago, the Roman Catholic Church as a whole had the clarity, discernment to say that you can't bless what is not good. But um, there, there seems to have been a change on that. The article continues, still the Vatican stressed that marriage remains exclusively between a man and a woman, and any priest granting a blessing to a same-sex couple must, quote, avoid any form of confusion or scandal, end quote, that could suggest otherwise. So someone like me might ask, well, what's the difference? Uh, and they probably do go into the details, but so many times it almost feels as though people want to make a distinction without a difference so that they can get away with doing what they want to do. They want to bless gay unions. They want... Uh, to validate people who identify as gay relationships that, that that they think are holy and good, but they also don't want to offend the old liners who don't want marriage to be disrespected by being conflated with uh, another kind of union. So this is kind of maybe having their cake and eating it too. The article continues, Francis, Pope Francis, 87, has made liberalization toward LBGTQ Catholics a hallmark of his papacy, since he became Pope in 2013, he has urged decriminalization of homosexuality. When asked in 2013 about gay priests, he famously replied, If someone is gay and he searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? And the answer is, you're the Pope. And you're a member of the priesthood of all believers. You know, a, 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 a Protestant would say, do you have the Holy Spirit or not? Have you read the Scriptures or not? Do you know God's will and instructions or not? Can you not, can you not present that? earnestly. Monday's declaration is a, quote, major step forward, end quote, for the church in regards to LGBTQ people, said the Reverend James Martin, an American Jesuit priest who had advocated for the LGBTQ Catholic community. The declaration rec recognizes, this is a quote, the deep desire in many Catholic same-sex couples for God's presence in their loving relationships, end quote. Um, yeah, let's let's stop with that article there. This is, of course, a left-leaning publication, NPR. And ever since Francis got installed as Pope, there's been a lot of excitement about him, a lot of hopes on the progressive left that he would change longstanding uh, positions of the church with respect to, to gay and trans people, maybe with respect to, to women uh, priests. Although, interestingly, it seems as though they're changing on the gay stuff, the critical gender stuff, before they're changing on 
female priests. That's that's an interesting thing. But one of the things that I thought might be at play here was uh, sorry about that. There's this inclination that Roman Catholics, you know, Protestants, we don't bless everything, but but Roman Catholics, they want to bless everything. So here's a funny video I found of a priest to come bless her car because it keeps breaking down. To bless the priest her actually car? came out to bless a car. <laughs> Mechanic, I've never seen brains. this in my life. What? So, yeah, that seems what? kind of insane to somebody like me, but whenever you're, this is part of a, 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 a culture that's just different from mine, where you're really getting the priest involved in blessing lots of different things. So, you know, here in my sphere, you know, you only ask a blessing upon those things that you actually intend to to make holy, keep holy, be a place of worship, be a, an act of, of uh, holiness. That's not necessarily what Roman Catholics have in mind as they are uh, asking priests to bless things. Um, of course, the the classical thing that Protestants have against Roman Catholics is this kind of works righteousness, this high sacramental theology where there's this notion that you can persist in sin and basically be okay if you regularly partake of the sacraments and confess your sins, and that's a no-no with Protestant theology. With Protestants, generally, if you're saved, if you are of the elect, if you're part of the covenant community, you, you stop sinning. You don't bless sin. The Roman Catholic Church has a long history of blessing people who are in un, unrepentant, persistent sin, and um, uh, I'm sure I'm going to hear about this in the comments. <laughs> All right, so here's the actual document, Fiducia Supplicans, and you'll see why I haven't read it. It's super long. And um, I'm sure it has all the reasoning and rationale there. Oh, you see all the citations. It's uh, it's beyond me. I'm sure it makes reference to a number of doctrinal documents that I do not appreciate or uh, have any backing in. One of the things that I do appreciate, though, is uh, Bishop Robert Barron, who's a Roman Catholic bishop here in America. I found him to be largely very reasonable and uh, likable. So he put out a statement about this, and here's what it says. On Monday, the Discastery for the Doctrine of the Faith with the approval of Pope Francis published a declaration entitled Fiducia Supplicans, which has given rise to a good deal of commentary and controversy. The document allows for the possibility of blessing those in irregular or same-sex relationships. Despite some misleading reporting in the media, Fiducia Supplicans is in no way, it in no way sanctions irregular bonds or changes the Church's teaching on marriage and sexuality. Sexuality. It further specifies that no liturgical blessing can be offered to those in such unions, but rather an informal pastoral blessing. I'm going to say that again. It further specifies that no liturgical blessing can be offered to those in such unions, but rather an informal pastoral blessing. That is so weird to me. This latter benediction is a calling forth of the divine grace to help those who receive it to live more fully in accord with God's will and to enhance whatever is good, true, and beautiful in their lives. That is so weird. Here's his commentary. He says, I believe that the declaration is very much congruent with the pastoral instincts of Pope Francis, who always wants to remind those who are living the Christian life in a less than perfect way that they are, nevertheless, loved and cherished by God. To all of Jesus' brothers and sisters, the church should never fail to be a source of welcome, compassion, and blessing. So I don't know how much of this is Bishop Barron submitting to the authority of his pope. Maybe he personally doesn't like it, but he's doing the very best he can to say nice things about his pope and decisions that, that his pope makes. But I think that this this is on its face just crazy it, it, to make this distinction between official liturgy and an informal blessing, and then to say, well, this arrangement in its nature is not good, we're not calling it good, but we're praying for the true, the good, and the beautiful to be brought out of that. That's not the same thing. So if you told me, okay, here is a liturgy or uh, a framework for asking God to free and liberate people from sexual sin— or to convict them in sinful uh, unions that they have bound themselves in. Like, that would make sense to me. You know, that would not be politically correct. It would make so many people angry. But um, that's not what it's talking about. It's saying, like, 
there's something good and true and beautiful here. Let's bless it and ask God to grow it. But but that fundamentally misunderstands the nature of these things, which is that, that by the very nature of the bodies these these people inhabit, the very nature of the relationship is unholy and an affront to God. There is nothing true, good, or beautiful to bless that that maintains. Rather, the only thing that would please God is to to end that sin and to build something new. So if if that sounds crazy to you, uh, this is exactly the path that Rosaria Butterfield walked, who was a married lesbian woman uh, teaching critical gender theory in a college and then read her Bible for the first time, and the Holy Spirit moved and worked on her and radically changed her so that, that she left all of that behind. That's the sort of thing that happens whenever one radically encounters the Lord. But but what the Roman Catholic Church is presenting is some some kind of notion where you can be blessed and holy in the midst of an unholy and ungodly situation. And um, and I think that whether or not you have good intentions, good feelings as you do something like this, it, you're harming people when you do it because you're giving comfort in the midst of a situation that should make them uncomfortable, that should make them unhappy. You know, this is this is how human nature is, is humans only change whenever they're made to be uncomfortable. And so that's what the role of the church is supposed to be, not just among covenant believers that are already part of the covenant body, but uh, especially when you look at the early church in the Roman context, we were salt and light in a world. We cast a light in a dark place that people wanted to stay dark. We we, we put salt in places that people wanted to stay bland, and that means that people often took offense to the public witness of Christians who stood against the culture of their day. That's the role that the church has here and now, just, not just in America, but across the world in every cultural context. There, there are things that are an affront to God that estrange people from God that the church needs to stand against, and it in in that case, offend the culture. Not that we want to offend the culture, but that's what righteousness requires. And the fact that the Roman Catholic Church seems to have no framework for this, but they seem to have at this point, and I'm not saying all Catholics, I'm just saying the leadership at this point seems to have been co-opted to to just not even be able to understand the the role of conviction in the life of faith. They, they seem to think that the role of the church is only to bless the true, good, and beautiful and to have nothing to say about the bad, and that's really just a very unfortunate place to be. I, I, I think that that effectively neuters the Roman Catholic Church. And so um, I, I've got other concerns about Roman Catholic doctrine, but this is a very practical thing that as a Methodist, it hits very close to home, uh, and that's the direction I'll expand it out. But I, I wanted to, to just briefly make reference to this video um, this movie that um, I don't think you should be able to hear it on Netflix. They made this about um, it's a it's a series of imagined conversations between the previous pope and the current pope. Of course, Ratzinger stepped down from his role as pope, and then um, uh, the, the the new guy he stepped in. And as I told you, liberals have uh, had their hopes on him for a long time. And so this is one of the most pretentious and insipid movies I ever watched because <laughs> it tries to make um, Pope Francis look intelligent or faithful, and Ratzinger just doesn't have anything to say in the face of the the pure conscience of, of um, uh, Pope Francis, and that's just, it's propaganda. You know, it, it does seem pretty clear that, that Pope Francis has an agenda, has a worldview that is not in keeping with any kind of traditional historical uh, understanding of what biblical Christian faith looks like. It seems like he's on board with a lot of people who want to change the the social fabric, not just of the West, but of the world. Um, but to imagine that what he is offering is really very respectable by anyone who— I mean, that's what's so crazy about this Robert Barron thing. Uh, uh, Bishop Barron is someone who's very well-read, very— uh, but anyone who looks reads ancient theology or even like medieval theology or early Reformation theology can't help but notice that modern progressive liberal theology is 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 it's it's mentally challenged. It is it's not at all on the same level. And to imagine that 
some kind of like modern conscience of liberalism and heart and like just wanting to bless what we can, to imagine that that it all silences the voice of the past, which is much more comfortable with condemnation and warning, is um, just this very narcissistic impulse. So as I said, this hits close to home, and and um, this is, uh, of course, not a United Methodist article that I'm calling up. Jeffrey Walton largely writes on Episcopal stuff, but he, uh, he wrote an article on a worship service that took place at the uh, National, oh heck, what's it called? Mm, Washington, Washington Nat- National Cathedral. If you've ever been there, it's a huge, beautiful building, but if you if you look at this picture, this is a man dressed in drag with a nun's habit on headdress. And so, what what was this? This is the Reverend Mother Felix Culpa. Felix means blessed. Culpa means sin. So the blessed sin uh, I, I learned when I looked this up yesterday uh, it would be original sin. Uh, uh, it's been called that before because that then necessitated Christ coming, and Christ coming is a good thing. So. Calling himself Mother Felix Culpa uh, is in some sense blessing sin, and not just sin in general, but original sin, of the House of Magnificent Intentions. And, you know, the, the zinger I have there is, you know, you know what good intentions pave, right? If you don't look up good intentions pave. Uh, he participated in the November 30th evening service as a reader attired in oversized headgear and heavy makeup. Culpa is part of the satirical drag group Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, controversially invited earlier this year as honorees at the L.A. Dodgers Pride Night, a decision that made national news for the the baseball team. So if you don't know about this, it was a borderline pornographic gay show where they're dressing in religious regalia and then simulating sex acts upon other men. It It was grotesque. This is the outfit that got invited to a supposedly Christian worship service. Um, the context of Culpa's participation, I'm skipping ahead, uh, but I'll have the link to the article here if you want to read it on your own time. Uh, the, the context of his participation at the cathedral was a service dedicated in honor of murdered Episcopalian Matthew Shepard, whose remains are interred within, intended as a remembrance by the LTGBTQIA plus community. Culpa read a prayer for wanderers by transgender theologian Shannon T.L. Kearns, and I actually pulled up the uh, video here. Here's, here's, here's the scene. A prayer for wanderers. God of the seekers and dreamers, the disaffected and disillusioned, the worn out, the burnt out, the rejected and leavers, we ask with his for face painted as we travel, in that big habit, as we doubt, that's a picture of Matthew Shepard right as there. We, meander. we ask for the grace to leave when necessary. So yeah, as you as you you know, as I started reading this, I started thinking maybe they were like making a mockery as like a show, but no, he seems to be really serious and earnest in this prayer for wanderers that he says, and uh, I'll have the link there if you want to go watch it. But what what you'll notice. What they did here, well, if you don't know who Matthew Shepard is, here's Matthew Shepard. It's a picture of him. He was the inspiration. What happened to him was the inspiration for what happened in the play, The Laramie Project. This was huge in uh, the 1990s as uh, an effort to bring attention to the persecution of gay people in America. Um, the the guy was beaten to within an inch of his life and then left on a, uh, a fence. He went into a coma and died several days later, and it caught the national stage because it was reported as a hate crime against him because he was gay. And so from that day on, he's been known as kind of like a, a martyr of the gay community. The problem is that it's a lie. Um, it was a case that the prosecution made to bring down a harsher, heavier sentence on the guys who killed him. But uh, the the witnesses used in that case later recanted that it had anything to do with homosexuality. It all had to do with a drug deal and money and dysfunction and just Shepard was a messed up guy and he was tied up with other messed up guys. But it doesn't matter what the truth is. The media got a hold of it and used it as a wedge in the culture war issues. And so that continues to today, where the National Cathedral had a worship service in which they honor him as a sort of 
martyr, even though it doesn't look like he was pursuing righteousness in any biblical sense, even though he was caught up in a way of life, drugs and debauchery and homosexuality, he was suicidal before it even happened. That doesn't matter. What matters is he was gay. He died at the other at the hands of other people that we chose were to believe were homophobes. And so it fits this narrative of this is not a righteous nation. It's not a righteous culture. Um, look what happens to gay people. Gay people and trans people kill themselves or are killed because of hateful bigots like this guy. And so the job of the enlightened elites of our culture are to borderline worship people like this, to say their names, you know, and you saw this with the BLM stuff as well. They 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 also pick martyrs of people who uh, were breaking the law and not complying with law enforcement and got harmed in the process, and then they they valorize those folks as well. The, the whole intention here is to upend society, to disrupt the fabric of um, uh, law-abiding, uh, normal people, and to elevate people who interrupt social norms and um, social stability. So what what is undergirding all of this? You know, for people who are looking at the Roman Catholic Church and uh, the loosening of standards there around sexuality, when you're looking at the Episcopal Church and the fact, you know, they've already blessed same-sex unions and marriages and welcomed— They've they've already done all this stuff. Why are they continuing to push this very extreme, very offensive? And why would it be offensive? You know, this is something I've talked about in a couple other videos. But um, you'll you'll notice that, that this this gentleman that got up there, uh, Felix Culpa, uh, he he's covered in makeup, um, and that's what you. I mean, this is participating in the whole social phenomenon of uh, the the drag show. But that's essentially where women dress or men dress up as women in very bombastic fashion and put on an affect that then is supposed to. It's like tapping into a different uh, mentality, identity, um, and it directly corresponds to my mind with minstrel shows, which of course was white people putting on black makeup and putting on a different affect of someone that they simultaneously look down on and fetishized. So psychologically, it's the same thing. You got minstrel shows, now you got drag shows, but then what's going on within the, all these different denominational bodies is you had this organization, the Church of Jesus Christ, which has very clear sexual ethics spelled out in our scriptures, lived out for 2,000 years, and you have this, this very public, very caustic um, activism that is not likable, that is not attractive, and yet is prevailing. And it, it's, it's because it is a concerted effort to, to turn the values that the dominant culture had against itself, and it's been largely successful. So, hey, you say you value love. Well, we don't feel loved by you, so you need to give us space to be who we are, and you need to feel, you know, you want to feel guilty, you want to talk about original sin, your original sin is that you harmed us, and so you owe it to us to apologize, to repent, and to feel perpetual guilt. And because we had this long period after World War II where we didn't talk about doctrine, where we didn't require believers to actually know it was in their Bible, you have this whole population now that really doesn't know what to do with this critique. And so, shamefully, they... You know, we we lift up a martyr of Matthew Shepard and go, man, yeah, I guess we've got something really bad to feel feel about. You know, we we talk about you know how gay people have a higher suicide rate, higher disease rate, higher um, uh, drug problems, and uh, you know it couldn't possibly because it's a dysfunctional way of life and very unhealthy way to to live in the world. It has to be because they are internalizing the hatred that I supposedly have for them. And, you know, it's not that that I and others have legitimate critiques of lifestyle and culture. It has to be that we are undergirded by irrational hatred and fear, homophobia. And, uh, you know, it's really just my problem that I'm putting onto them. And if I would just change, then they would just be okay. That's, that's what's undergirding all of this. And what we're finding is a large, large number of people in Christian leadership are totally not up to the task of of presenting a a, a counterfactual, of presenting um, of proudly standing behind the history 
of calling people to repent of sin and refusing to bless that which is not good. So I'm not sure. Oh, well, I know how I wanted to wrap this up. I got a buddy named David who writes me. He's a gay fella who um, has chosen. Uh, he, he wrote me several months ago just saying, I'm going to be a person who's going to write you and tell you what I think about stuff. And he shares the same frustration with me that that religious Christian institutions have been so inept to the task of providing a, a, a different vision. You know, this, this, is, this man is not a believer. He's actively, I think he's married to another man. He's, that's part of his life, but he's also very clear that to be Christian means something, and it, it, it does not allow for people to live the way that worldly people do, and that has sexual implications as well. And so one of the things that he would want me to do in this piece is to just say, you know, Christian holiness does require that we say no to some things. You know, this is what he wants me to help other people understand is there is a role for the people who are attracted to, to people of the same sex can and do have a place in the church, but that place is contingent upon learning self-denial and practicing self-denial, which is not something a lot of people are willing to practice. But that's that's the standard here. The, the Roman Catholic Church is wrong in blessing things that are not conducive to Christian life. The only way to approach uh, folks involved in gay relationships is to say, yes, God loves you, but he is offended and angry with your sin, just like he's offended and angry with mine. And the only way to be in right relationship with him is to stop doing it, repent, live a life of holiness. And this is what it looks like. So the, the wonderful thing is that you can be holy and just not have sex. In fact, you know, Jesus and Paul both had very clear things to say about that that's actually very liberating. Um, and so if that's something you haven't heard about before, it might be worth picking up your Bible and looking up what Jesus talks about with spiritual eunuchs or when, when Paul says, I wish everyone could be as I am. It's, we live in a culture that's awash in obsessed obsession with sexuality and fulfilling sexual urges and uh in many ways true freedom is just not playing that game anymore because the thing is scratching that itch never leaves you satisfied for long if you want true and deep satisfaction then there's only one can satisfy it and that's not a sexual desire it's a desire for spiritual intimacy with christ jesus so if you haven't had that invitation before I, I would invite you to reach out to me. You can write me privately at plainspokenpod at gmail.com. Also, you know, I understand I'm talking about things that people get upset about. Um, you're very welcome to write in the comments, but if you're nasty or mean, I'm just going to delete you and might block you. So uh, be warned. I appreciate any consideration folks have given to this. Pray for the Roman Catholic Church. Pray for the Episcopalian Church. Pray for the Methodist Church. Just pray for the Church of Jesus Christ that that God would speak loudly and clearly in ways that uh, that we can't deny or or compromise. All right, that's it for me today. See ya.